Hey there, we are so thankful that you have made the choice to watch one of ACC's messages online. You know, as you are watching and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. You're sitting at your phone or your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. But you know, we say you belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means we would love to have you join us during one, uh, one of our Sunday services at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. So we would love to have you jump into this message and we're believing God is gonna do some awesome things in your life today. Morning, ACC. Man, I love uh, all of your faces. This is a beautiful church, isn't it? Uh, the church is the body of Christ, so you beautiful people make up this beautiful place, and I'm really, uh, really happy to be with you all this morning. My name's Matt. I serve as one of the pastors here at ACC, and we are beginning a brand new series today uh, called A Little Bit of Wisdom Goes a Long Way. Do you believe that? Do, do you, uh, do you uh, know what wisdom is? We're going to have some opportunities over the next four weeks to talk about what wisdom is and what it isn't. And uh, man, I am <laughs> reading some of these. These are not wisdom, am I right? Uh, some of these little, have you ever received actual like bad advice like this from someone? They had good intentions maybe. They were telling you something and they thought it would be great advice, but it was terrible advice. Uh, man, I, uh, we had an opportunity to ask you all to share some bad advice online this week. And I, I saw a few of them that were, that were pretty great. I wanted to share them with you. Um, yeah, one of them was uh, Tom Diamond says, only text while driving on straight roads. Uh, it's much harder to steer with your knee when making turns. A little bad advice. Listen, I, I want to preface this. These are bad advice, right? Don't go out and do this and say, I, I, was, I was told this was a great idea. Uh, uh, Pastor Brian shared one. He says, buy a timeshare. It's a great investment. <laughs> um, I really like my timeshare. So, I'll, I don't know, whatever. All right, um, let me see. We got another one in here. Uh, Christy Curry says, go ahead and ask if she's having twins. <laughs> it's just a bad idea, uh, even if they're not twins, right? Just don't ask. Unless you are 100% sure, don't ask. It's, no, uh, it's a bad idea. Uh, uh, this was probably my favorite one. Steve Perna says, uh, hand me a lighter so I can see where the gas is leaking. <laughs> that's, that's bad advice right there. So uh, all, just to add a little bit of fun to this series throughout the, the month, uh, if you go online and have some bad advice, maybe something someone's actually told you or you just make up something on the spot, share that with us and put a little bad advice. Uh, but ultimately what we're really interested in is not bad advice. Or a little, a little bit of, what was it? Yeah, a little bad advice. We're not looking for that, uh, ultimately, right? We're looking for wisdom. We're looking to understand what wisdom is and what it isn't and how can we apply that to our lives so we can be people who are wise. And in Scripture, uh, we have an opportunity to, to get wisdom because we're going to spend the next four weeks in the book of Proverbs. And the book of Proverbs is really designed around wisdom. It's chocked full of little miniature proverbs, and every proverb is a little bit of wisdom, right? Uh, in, in Proverbs 4, 7, it says this. It says, getting wisdom is the wisest thing you can do. Getting wisdom is the wisest thing you can do. And I can actually break that down for you a little bit because there's a difference between wisdom and, and knowledge, right? So wisdom, uh, right, well, knowledge builds the Titanic, Wisdom avoids icebergs. Do you see the difference there? You see, someone who has a lot of knowledge might know how to build a house, but it takes wisdom to build a home. Those are two different things, right? 
You could say that it takes knowledge to understand God. The Bible says that even Satan and all of his demons know who God is. So it just takes knowledge to understand God, but it takes wisdom to walk in God's ways and to walk and follow God's paths. So wisdom and knowledge are not the same thing, and we're going to learn that over the next four weeks. We're also going to learn a lot about just this book called Proverbs, and if if you want, you can go ahead and grab a Bible. We're going to spend some time flipping through it today. If you don't own a Bible, there's one in the chair back in front of you. You can grab that and put your name in it and walk away with it. Uh, We don't have any of the library detectors. There's no alarms that are going to go off. We want you to own a Bible. Uh, Your first little bit of wisdom today is you ought to own a Bible. So walk away with a Bible today if you need one. Uh, We're going to spend some time in in the book of Proverbs, which is pretty much right in the middle of the Bible. So if you open up in the middle somewhere, you're going to find the book of Proverbs. Now Proverbs, here's uh, some fun facts about Proverbs. Proverbs has 31 chapters, and each of them uh, are short enough that they're not going to like completely wreck your day if you decide, hey, on, on the 10th of August, I'm going to read chapter 10 in Proverbs. And today is the 12th of August, so I'm going to read the 12th chapter in Proverbs. Because there's 31, it's almost like God designed it that way for us to, obviously when it was written, there weren't chapters and verse marks between them. But the way that it was organized when the chapters and verses got put in make it really easy for you and I to read a little bit of wisdom every day. And we can do that over and over again throughout our life. If, it's, if you're wondering what proverb to read on the 18th, anyone have any ideas? 18th proverb, right? So it's super easy. Uh, it's broken down like that. It, the 31 chapters, here's another little fun fact about Proverbs. It's broken really into two parts. The first nine chapters in Proverbs are really kind of pre-Proverbs. The Proverbs don't actually start until chapter 10. By Proverbs, I mean those little one-liners that jump from this to that, little bits of wisdom all over the place. That actually starts in chapter 10. So chapters 1 through 9, really what you're reading if you read those, and I recommend that you read that part, it's really establishing a case for wisdom. Why do you need wisdom? Why should you read the rest of this book? Why are these Proverbs important? If you want someone to to explain it and to really kind of set the table for you, Proverbs chapter 1 through 9, that's what it does. It explains the importance of wisdom. Another thing I want to do with us uh, this morning, I want to explain as you go through the Proverbs, when you spend uh, the, the 19th day of the month in Proverbs what? 19, as you're reading through the Proverbs every day, you're going to encounter different characters in the Proverbs. The Proverbs mention different types of people, and I want you to know what you're reading when you read the Proverbs. So let's take a quick moment. Uh, The way I kind of have our our, our message broken up today is I'm going to spend a little bit of time explaining uh, kind of an overview of Proverbs and these four people you're going to encounter, and then I'm going to give you a little bit of wisdom to walk away with today our first of four weeks. All right, so the first part, I want you to know there's four different types of people that you will encounter in the book of Proverbs. And the first person is this. We call them the simple. The simple. And here's what the simple person is. The simple person, they don't make decisions that are stupid because they're foolish. They make decisions sometimes that aren't that great because they just don't know any better. They're, they're a bit naive. How many of you uh, know someone who's just a bit naive about something, right? They're, yeah, right? All of us, right? Raise your hand. How many of you looked in the mirror this morning, right? All of us, there is something that we have never encountered before that if we were to encounter it for the first time, we wouldn't really know what to expect. You know, my wife and I, we went to a wedding last night, and we got in really late, so it was really hard to wake up this morning for church. And, uh, but at, at the wedding we were at, you know, it's, it's a young couple. I was... His small, his small group leader in, in the youth group uh, in Delaware. And they're up there on the stage, and the, you know, they're, they're looking in each other's eyes. Isn't young love just like so pretty? And it's like, it's like cute, right? It's cute. There's no better word than, than the word cute to describe what's happening. And then they, they pull out, and they've written letters to each other, and they're reading it. And it's, it's adorable, right? 
And when they're making vows to each other, you have the guy who's looking at his bride, and he's, you know, yeah, he stands on this side, huh? And he, he's looking at his bride, and she's, she's saying, you know, he's saying some, some vows to her, and he's promising, hey, no matter what, we're going to do this thing. And then she says the same thing back. And all, everyone who's watching who's been married longer than a day knows <laughs> they don't really fully understand the promise they're making right now. They don't know that when they say, no matter what, what is about to happen? Like, what what they're saying, no matter what, too. You don't have to be married for for long to encounter your first, like, real trial. And then these little lovey, like, I'm going to love you no matter what, and we're never going to fight. And we're going to be like, man, they are just simple, right? They have no clue. And sometimes that's a beautiful thing, because there's a lot of things that we would never agree to if we knew the ending, right? If we knew all the things we'd have to go through, we would just say, ah, nah, never mind, right? Sometimes it's good to go into things a little bit naive. When my wife and I uh, uh, were getting married, she was my fiance at the time. She lived in Delaware, and I was in Virginia, and we were trying to find an apartment that we were gonna live in together once we got married. And we, we had two options. We had one that was affordable, and we had one that was nice we didn't know any better. So which one do you think we picked? <laughs> nice. Yeah, man, we didn't, we didn't have two dimes rubbed together. We, we got in this thing, and we, like, how are we going to afford this? But we, we, we just, you know, we were, we were simple. I wouldn't blame, us, uh, blame it on us being foolish. We just had never had a bill, a monthly, like, responsibility. You know, our parents so far had taken care of these things. We just didn't know any better. And our whole, like, first year, or we've been married 16 years now, our whole first 16 years of marriage has been a little bit of naivety all the, all the way through, right? That's really kind of what, it's just, you, you think about things, anytime you look at someone and you think, oh, isn't that cute? What you're really saying is, aren't they simple? They don't know anybody. <laughs> think about it, you know, you see a little baby with its toe in its mouth, and you're thinking, well, isn't that cute? Really, that's disgusting. I mean, if, if I put my toe in my mouth right now, no one here would be thinking, oh, no, right? <laughs> Proverbs 7.7 7 says, I saw among the simple, I noticed among the young men, a youth who had no sense. So the Bible even recognizes that oftentimes the simple uh, just really means that you're, you're young. Uh, you haven't really experienced certain things yet, and you don't know any better. And oftentimes we find that simple people, uh, they're a little bit stubborn, and they have to learn things the hard way. They don't really care what advice you want to give them. Uh, they, think they, they think they know better, and, and they don't. In fact, uh, one way to really see simple, uh, we could go to the, the words of the great philosopher, uh, Taylor Swift. And here's... <laughs> Here's what she says, a lyric in a song. When you're 15, someone tells you they love you, you're going to believe them. That's called simple. You all remember the first time that you thought you loved someone, and then they dumped you? You Maybe that only happened to me. Um, But man, I thought my life was over. I thought there's no, I mean, that was true love. That was my soulmate. And now they're gone. I didn't know any better. You see, we're all simple-minded in certain ways, and it's important to remember that. You know, the cure for being simple, according to the Bible, is time. So the best way to put this is that uh, the more time you experience in life, the less simple you'll be every day, because the more things you'll experience, the more wisdom, hopefully, you'll have gleaned from Scripture and from others, uh, godly people around you, and you'll, you'll know better the more and more you go through life. Uh, one way I like to think about this concept of, of time and being simple, I, and my wife and I have been married 16 years now. If I look right now at what I think of love at in this moment, and I compare it to what I thought love was on our wedding day, I look back at it and I say, oh, isn't that cute? <laughs> and I know that 16 years from now, I'm going to look back at the, the love I have for her today, a love that I'm like, man, this is top. Like, man, if... This is it. Like, we've, we've arrived, and I'm going to look back at it and think, well, isn't that cute? You see, time is kind of the cure 
for simple. All right, here's another person we're going to encounter in the Proverbs, and it's the fool. The fool is different than the simple. The simple does sometimes some stupid things because they don't know any better. The fool knows better. The fool knows this is the wrong thing to do, but I'm going to do it anyway. Or there's a right thing to do, and I'm not going to do it because I don't want to. That person uh, in in Proverbs, we, we find them called over and over again the fool. In Proverbs 10, 23, it says, Doing wrong is fun for a fool. Now, if, if I were to ask you to raise your hand, how many of you know that sometimes doing the wrong thing is really fun? All of us, I'm sure, could raise two hands and be like, I got some stories to share with you, right? Sometimes acting like a fool can be synonymous with having fun, but we all know that that is temporary and it's something that we end up regretting very quickly. So what it says is doing wrong is fun for a fool, but living wisely brings pleasure to the sensible. When I think about my daughters and when I think about fools, uh, really kind of as a parenting strategy, what I really want is I want them to avoid fools. I don't want fools in my daughter's lives, right? When they're making friends and they're finding people to hang out with and, and they're trying to figure out who to spend time with, I don't want them spending time with foolish people because Scripture is really clear. It says in, in Proverbs thirteen twenty, it says, Walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and what? Get in trouble. Now, if you think about a moment in your life where you did the most foolish thing you can think of, who were you with? You were with someone pretty foolish, weren't you? They're like, come on, let's do it. Here, hold my beer, right? I mean, like we, like those moments in our, in our lives where we've done foolish things, it's because we are hanging out with and spending time usually with foolish people. And the Bible is very clear that when we do that and we associate with fools, we get in trouble. When I was um, maybe 17 years old, my, my best friend and I, we took his mom's new Jeep Cherokee, and we took our two girlfriends, and we went out to a farm to shoot BB guns because we wanted to show our girls, you know, how manly we were. <laughs> so they were sitting in the back of the Jeep Cherokee, and my friend and I we were shooting BBs at, at cans and things and squirrels or whatever, and we were just, like, having a good time. And, and at the very end, when my gun was all out of BBs, I started walking around kind of haphazardly with it, and my friend said, Matt, careful, man, you pointed that thing at me. I'm like, James, just relax. There's nothing in it. He's like, you never know. You just, you never know. And I knew that. I knew you're never supposed to point a gun at someone, even if you're pretty sure that it's empty. I, I knew better, but I was, I was being stubborn because I knew there was nothing in it, and he was freaking out a little bit. So I'm like, James, calm down. So I was like moving around. He's like, dude, don't point that at me. And he goes, and he gets in the back of his mom's Jeep, with our two girlfriends, and he pulls the, the back hood of the Jeep down because he's tired of me acting foolish. And I try to show him that I know there's nothing in it, so I point it down at a can on the ground, and I shoot, and nothing happens. I'm like, see, there's nothing in it. He's like, you don't, you know, he's yelling through the glass, you don't know, stop pointing it. So I decide to really show him how confident I am. And I point it at the back windshield of his mom's new Jeep Cherokee. <laughs> where my best friend and my girlfriend and his girlfriend are sitting And in my foolish confidence, I pull that trigger, and the glass shatters. And luckily, the only thing that got hurt that day was my ego and a windshield. You see, the cure for foolishness is tragedy. Foolish people often have to learn the lesson that they're going to learn to to be able to remove themselves from foolishness. What often has to happen, the cure for that, is something major and tragic in in their life. For me, in that moment of of shooting out that windshield, when I got the bill for one of those, you know, defrost windshields on a brand new Jeep Cherokee, it was like $450. To me, that was called tragedy. I didn't have the money for that. But if you think about, like in a more serious instance, a foolish decision you've made in your life, uh, likely you can associate that with tragedy. Maybe you you hurt someone you loved. Maybe you hurt yourself. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe some major thing happened. And when you look back at your foolishness, it caused a major tragedy or a major problem in your life. And I want you to understand that, that that's not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes God allows those tragedies to be those moments that pull you out of your foolishness and back onto a path of wisdom. I wanted to uh, think through this for a moment. 
uh, a pastor, uh, Chris Hodges, he says, every tragedy has a lesson equal in significance to its heartbreak. Think about that for a moment. Every tragedy has a lesson built in. And the, the, the level, the height of the tragedy is usually equal to the, the lesson and the amount that you learn from it. You see, I'm very careful with, with guns now, aren't I? I know not to, to assume a gun is empty ever again. That tragedy helped pull me out of my foolishness, and though it cost me $450, or maybe cost you your job, or cost you your marriage, or cost you uh, whatever, that tragedy is something that had to happen to pull you out of your foolishness. I want to encourage you, if you've had a moment of tragedy because of foolishness in your life, that through God, God can take that, that worst moment, that tragedy in your life, and turn it into a happy part of your story. What I mean by that is 20 years from now, you can look back at a tragedy that happened in 2018 and think, let me tell you how that's a really, really good part of what God was doing in my life and how he used that to put me back on the right path. And that can be a really, really good part of how God is working in your life. Here's another type of uh, person that you will encounter in Proverbs. And we call this person the mocker or the scoffer. Uh, sometimes, maybe in your translation, you might also see the words uh, wicked or evil. So it talks about wicked, the, the wicked do this, or the scoffer does this, the mocker does this. What this really is, is this is the fool on steroids. This is a fool who isn't satisfied just being foolish in and of themselves. They want to bring you in. They want to, if you're doing the right thing, they're going to make fun of you for it and to, to bully you into doing things their way. If they uh, see some other people doing bad things, they encourage it and they get excited by it. These are people who have no interest whatsoever in doing the right thing. In fact, they want to bring as many people into the wrong thing as they can with them. And the Bible is really harsh in what you and I ought to do when we encounter a scoffer. This is, a, this is something, if you want to take your Bibles and look at um, Proverbs 9, we're actually going to, the next four verses I read are going to be out of Proverbs chapter 9, so that's a good spot to put your finger or your thumb or dog ear the page. And here's what it says about a scoffer. It says, anyone who rebukes a mocker will get an insult in return. Anyone who corrects the wicked will get hurt. So don't bother correcting mockers. They will only hate you. But correct the wise, and they will love you. In other words, if you have a mocker in your life, the Bible really just says avoid them. There is no point in you trying to correct them. There's no point in trying to speak wisdom into their life because they aren't going to listen. Only thing you're going to get back is insult. So then what is the cure for someone like that? If, if we know that, that ultimately the cure for the simple is time and the cure you know, for uh, the fool, I don't know if I ever talked about the cure for the fool. Did I tell you guys the cure for the fool? The tragedy, I did. That are good. The cure for the mocker then is, is God. In other words, God is going to have to be the one that steps in to change someone's heart if, they're, uh, if they live like this. If they hate all things good, if they hate all things that are right and true, uh, the only person who can really kind of grab them and shake them and say, you, you, man, you've got to knock it off is God. God's going to have to do a work in their heart. Uh, the fourth type of person you're going to encounter in the book of Proverbs is the wise. Man, what a, what a goal, you know, for each of us. We ought to all, in our own lives, we, want to, we ought to want to be wise. We, we want to be known as people of wisdom. If I were to ask someone in your family, if I were to reach out to your children and say, hey, are mom and dad, are they simple? Are they foolish? Or do they, they mock all things good? Or are, they, are, do, are they wise? I want my kids to look at me and say, my dad is full of wisdom. This is what I want to be. Just one verse down in Proverbs 9.9, 9, it says, Instruct the wise, and they will be even wiser. 
Teach the righteous and they will learn even more. Really, the question is, how teachable are you? Are you in this room right now, this morning, willing to hear the words from God's word that, that, that God, I, I pray, is speaking through my mouth? Are you willing to hear what I'm saying right now and say, I want to learn from this? Because that, that's a sign of wisdom. That means I want, to, I want to learn more. I want to be thankful when I hear truth. And I want to apply it to my life. Really, if I had to summarize these four personality types in Proverbs, here's how I would summarize it. If you try to correct the simple, they won't get you. If you try to correct the foolish, they will ignore you. If you try to correct the mocker, they will hate you. But if you try to correct the wise, they will thank you. And I want us to be known as a church of people who are pursuing wisdom, uh, of, of men and women and children who love wisdom and want to start on this path for wisdom. So now as we uh, move into our, our very first piece, the, the wisdom I want you to take away today. First of all, just to show of hands, how many of you want to be wise? That's an easy one, right? I, I, I would hate to say, how many of you just want to mock people? Don't, don't raise your hand, I don't want to know. But if you want to be a person that's known for wisdom, your question ought to be, well, where do I start? How does that journey start? What's the first thing I need to do to be a person of wisdom? And the Bible actually spells it out. It says uh, in, in this next verse we're going to look at, in Proverbs 9.10, the very next verse, it says, The fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. In other words, uh, or in the NIV translation, it says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So if you want to begin on a path of wisdom, if you need to begin again on a path of wisdom, if you need to kind of uh, wipe everything away and start from a clean slate, the best place to begin, according to Scripture, is the fear of the Lord. Now, we ought, we ought to ask ourselves, what does that mean? Does that mean that when I think about God, I think, oh, no, I'm afraid of God. I don't want God. I'm afraid of God, right? That's not what it's saying. It's not, the fear of the Lord isn't, a, the word that's used there doesn't mean that you are uh, like fearful of God, that you are afraid of God. Really, it's, it's a, a Hebrew word uh, that you're at. And what that word means is that it's, a, it's a, a position of awe, it's a reverence, it's understanding who God is and how great and powerful God is. Until you understand that, all other wisdom that you try to, to glean will be uh, wasted on you. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. You have to start there. So I want to give you three things as we wrap up that if you want to really understand what it means to your at, what it really means to fear, to have a, an awe or a reverence for a holy God, these are three things I want to encourage you to be able to say to God and to mean them. And the first one is this, God, you are awesome. When you can understand that God is awesome and you can say, I believe this, I, I, I know it to be true, God, you are awesome. When you come to that understanding in your life, that is the first step in understanding what fear of God means. The fear of the Lord means, God, I recognize that you are awesome. And the root word of awesome, right, is awe. It means that everything you look at. When you look at your fingers and how they uh, intricate they are, and when you look at a brand new baby, or when you look at uh, the, the fact, the Bible says that God can measure all the stars in the universe, the whole, the, the breadth, the, all of the heavens he can measure with the breadth of his hands. When you understand the greatness of God in a, in a way that you are just completely awed by it, you know that there is no way you will ever comprehend everything that God comprehends. That is the beginning of this process of what it means to fear God. God is awesome. I love that word awesome. I love the word wonderful, to, to be full of wonder. I have no idea how God is and does. 99 point, continue that nine out for infinity. I have no idea how he does most of what he does. 
I just stand in awe at how amazing he is. And when you can do that, that's, that's the first part of this fear of the Lord. The, the second one, well, before I get into it, let me, let me show you this in Psalm 33. It says, let the whole world fear the Lord and let everyone stand in awe of him. Again, you have Urat and this a concept of awe and reverence going together. The second thing that you need to be able to say if you want to understand what it means to fear the Lord is, God, you are holy. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God is holy, church? You see, there's all sorts of words used in Scripture that describe God. There are words like righteous and and good, and he's a good father, and there's just, you could go into Scripture and find all sorts of words, but there's one word that is unique in, in describing God, and it's a word that when it's used to describe God, it's often used three times in a row. You see that God is righteous, and God is good, but you see that God is holy, holy, holy. In other words, if you had to pick one word to really describe God, the word I would pick is holy. What that word really means is God is is perfect. There's nothing wrong with him. Everything about him is, is exactly as it should be. That God is, is just, he's just amazing. Hebrews chapter 12 says this, Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. For our God is a devouring fire. And when you remember that God at any moment could, could, could end your life, that if, if he wanted to, uh, lightning could strike me right now and I'd just be left a grease puddle on this stage. When I understand that God has that kind of power and God chooses when and how he uses that power, when you understand that God is perfectly holy, that is going to help you, again, understand what it means to, to have a fear, a healthy fear of the Lord. Here's a third thing I want to encourage you to be able to say to God. It's, God, you are right. The fear that begins wisdom says, God, you are awesome. God, you are holy. And God, you are right. In other words, if you feel a certain way about something in your life, and you know from Scripture God feels another way about it, you're wrong. Make sense? When there's, when there's your way and God's way, God is always right. And until we can really come to an understanding that God's way is never the wrong way, God's way is always the right way, even if God's way doesn't make sense, even if God's way is hard, even if God's way hurts, even if it doesn't make logical sense to us, none of that matters. If you can understand and say, God, you are right, you will have taken that, that this third piece, this awesome, holy, and right, you will have a better understanding of what it means to fear God. Yeah, listen, you're not listening to what the world says about a certain topic. You're not looking at God's word and picking and choosing the parts that you like and leaving other parts ignored, because when you believe that God is always right, then every word of his is always right. You know, when people come up to me and say, how do you really believe this? Do you really believe that, that Jonah could live in the belly of a fish? That's impossible. You know what I say? You're right. I don't believe that a person can live in the belly of a well, but I believe Jonah did. I also don't believe that people can walk on water. I don't believe that people can be uh, resurrected from the dead. I don't believe that Jesus, uh, that, that, that a person in and of themselves can resurrect themselves from the dead, but I believe Jesus did it. I believe that, that God is right. You see what I'm getting at here? It doesn't matter if I can make sense of it. I believe that God is right. Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11 says this, The instructions of the Lord are perfect. That's a powerful word. That means there's nothing wrong with them. Reviving the soul, the decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The commands of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. 
Reverence for the Lord is pure, lasting forever. The laws of the Lord are true. Each one is fair. There are more, they are more desirable than gold, even the finest gold. They are sweeter than honey, even honey dripping from the comb. They are a warning to your servant, a great reward for those who obey them. Here's my question for you. Do you believe that God is awesome? Do you believe that God is holy? And do you believe that God is right? Because until you can come to grips with those three things, before you can have a fear of the Lord, you're not going to be able to build wisdom on top of this foundation because the Bible's clear. Remember, Proverbs 9.10, the, the beginning of wisdom, the foundation of of wisdom is a fear of the Lord. So as I invite some, some members from our worship team back on stage, I want to I wanna give you a so what. I want to give you something to, to walk away with, something to think about. Um, I would love to know that when we walk out of this room today that every single person in this room would say, Matt, I, I've decided I want to fear God. I want to trust God that he is awesome, and I, oh, I trust that he is holy, and I trust that he's right. And if you haven't made that decision, maybe you're struggling with one or more of those statements, I want to I wanna encourage you to, 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 to think through that. Because until you come to grips with the truth that God is awesome and holy and right, you're not going to be able to build the wisdom that you need in your life. You're not going to have it. Because it comes from God and the beginning of it, the foundation of it, is that truth. We're going to sing a song here in, in a moment. And the lyrics of this song do such an incredible job. They scream of God's awesomeness. They, they shout of God's holiness. They yell at the top of their lungs of God's righteousness. So I want to encourage you, while we sing this song together, I want you to, to maybe just sit if you need to, or stand if you'd like to, and, and read and listen and contemplate the truth that we've talked about today, because those truths are the beginning of wisdom. God is awesome, God is holy, and God is right. Let's pray together. God, I pray right now. God, if there's anyone in this room right now that needs to take that first step, they need to say, God, I want to start a relationship with you. I want to, I want to fear you. I want to have a, a healthy understanding of how great you are and how terrible and in need and broken I am. God, until I realize that you are amazing and great and awesome and I am the opposite of that, I am not going to be able to glean the wisdom I need for this life that you've created me to live. God, if there's someone in this room right now that needs to to declare wholeheartedly, God, you are awesome. God, you are, you are holy. And God, you are right. I want to encourage those people to maybe make that decision today. God, for all of us in this room, remind us daily of how great you are, how much we ought to fear you so that we can build wisdom into our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're in the room and you need to make a decision to follow Jesus for the first time, I'm going to be standing up here by the steps. I'm going to invite my wife to hang out with me. And if there's anyone else from our prayer team, maybe an overseer or staff that wants to, to join me on stage, we'd love to pray with you and, and help you begin that journey of wisdom by following God. Check out this song as we sing together. It's going gonna, it's gonna to move you. I believe it. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we as a staff and as a church are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep down into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on a Sunday morning at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. As a reminder, Please remember, you belong at ACC.